to this new video for my channel, The Mental Traveler. I'm Caro Herrera and today I'm going to be talking about a book called The Museum of Innocence by Turkish writer Erhan Pamuk. It was published in 2008, soon after the author had won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Before I begin though, let me just say two things. First, that this will be a video with spoilers, so if you haven't read the book, beware. And also that I would like to dedicate this video to my friend, Sofia, because this is her favorite book ever. When I was in college, one of my favorite teachers was this kindly old man who gave a course called Critic Literature. My friend Sophie and I always liked to talk to him about books and journalism, and in the end he knew quite well what our tastes in literature were, and so he'd often recommend stories to us. One day he told Sophie to read The Museum of Innocence, confident that she would love it, and he was right. It quickly became Sophie's favorite book, inspiring her one day to go visit Turkey. And with the years, her love for this novel hasn't diminished. And ever since she first read it, Sophie encouraged me to read The Museum of Innocence. But I was always hesitant because we don't have the exact same tastes in books. For example, the same teacher recommended her to read Blindness by José Saramago. And while the plot didn't appeal to me, I thought it was an essay rather than a novel. Because in Spanish, it's titled is an essay on blindness. And so I believed that The Museum of Innocence was going to be this philosophical view of love. But some years later, in November 2018, everything changed because every year one of the biggest book first in the world takes place in my hometown. And last year Orhan Pamuk attended. My friend really wanted to go to his book signing but couldn't. And since I was already gonna go that day anyways, I told her to give me her copy of the book. And so I pretended to be Sophie and met Orhan Pamuk and got his autograph for her. And although I'd never read his works, I was quite excited to meet my first ever Nobel Prize in Literature winner. And I remember that that very night I bought the ebook version of The Museum of Innocence. I didn't really start it until January, but it took me four days to devour the 700 pages novel. Set in Istanbul, covering around 30 years from the 70s onwards, this is a story of the relationship between Kemal and Fusun, a wealthy man and his poor younger relative. At the start of the book, he is practically engaged to this pretty young woman from his same circle in society. But when he meets up with Fusun and Kemal sees what a gorgeous beauty she has become, his life changes forever. They are both instantly smitten and lose no time in starting an affair. Several factors come into play though that tear them apart and when Fusun disappears without notice, Kemal starts to fall into this big depression. He's obsessed with Fusun and starts to grow isolated, drinking excessively and staying for hours in the apartment where they used to make love. With time his engagement falls apart and after a while he does manage to meet up with Fusun again and learns that she is now married. Still, not to be daunted by a husband, Kemal ends up sort of insulating himself into her household and her private life, going for dinner at her house several times a week and even venturing into the film business with her husband, choosing to make her a film star. An important factor I should mention here though is that at one point in the story Kemal starts to hoard as many objects as he can that Fusum comes into contact with and hoarding them over the years. For example, objects such as her earrings, a salt shaker she used for dinner, the cigarette stops she left in ashtrays, her perfumes and so on and so on. But getting back into the story, after many years of these weekly dinners at Fusun's house, Kemal gets his heart's desire when she and her husband divorce. Making plans to travel in Europe before getting married, they set out on their journey, but after a night of making love, they end up getting into a car accident where Fusun dies. Devastated over the next decades of his life, Kemal conceives the idea of creating a museum of her house where he can display all the objects he collected of her during their nine-year-old relationship. I give The Museum of Innocence a 4 out of 5 stars review and I'm really glad that I read it. It has it all, love, drama, history, culture, I cried more than once. And while some may find melancholic undertones of the narrative a bit hard to get through, the way in which they are delivered, the writing style, flowed so easily in my opinion. I enjoyed the fact that the author managed to write himself into that book. He meets the characters and towards the end we learn that the protagonist commissions him to write his and Fusun's story. And one really cool thing about the author is that in real life he actually bought a house and transformed it into a museum called the Museum of Innocence. It's in Istanbul where the story takes place. And it's not only an ode to the story he created, but a glimpse into the past of this city and the time period in which Orhan Pamuk lived during his younger years. 
And in the end, this novel is an ode to museums, and it made me appreciate the history that comes with every piece a museum owns. So yeah, even though The Museum of Innocence is not one of my favorite books, I still really loved it. There are some important factors to consider, though, as to why I'm only giving it a 4 out of 5 stars review. Towards the end of the novel, Kemal says that he doesn't expect that his story will be very clear to everyone, seeing as he himself doesn't quite get it. And I feel that this perfectly sums up what happened to me while reading The Museum of Innocence. It had been a really long time since a book challenged me so, and while it was quite a fascinating and fresh reading experience, it left me with so many unanswered questions. And I mean, Kemal and Fosun's relationship can be considered a conventional love story. And while this serves to make the novel more realistic, more toxic, and more complex, I, mean, I must confess that I did struggle to empathize and connect with the characters at certain bits. The thin line between love and obsession is a constant thing that I would ponder about as I read the novel. And because the story is told from the point of view of Kemal, I had to constantly recall this fact because whenever I felt that I wasn't liking what Fusun was doing or thinking or saying. For example, after she is married to another man and Kemal has nonetheless rooted himself into her life, I might find myself feeling upset that she is cold to him when all I've ever read about is how much he loves her because we are in his mind. But then I recalled that this was Kemal's point of view and so it wasn't fair to Fusun for me to judge her when I was seeing her through her lover's eyes. Whenever Kemal says that her actions hurt him or break his heart, sure, I do feel for him, for his vulnerability and loyalty, but then again, his foolishness or obstinacy or both don't allow him to even consider the possibility that Fusun might want a life of her own that does not involve him. And because I get the feeling that he couldn't live with such a truth, he can't process it. And so we don't see him dwelling or at least trying to understand what exactly is going through her mind at times. Why she's an enigma to him sometimes too. And in any case, as the story progressed, I would feel very angry at Kemal for sacrificing Fusun's dreams for the sake of the chance that he would one day marry her. An example could be when he promised her to make her a film star, but then when this is almost about to happen, he prevents it. He prevents her from achieving her dream by any means, because he's afraid he will lose her to stardom if she becomes successful. Thus, I was glad when she called him up for his selfish reasons and actions, for his selfish behavior. And sure, I think that she did love Kemal, but Fusun's feelings for him were more than just that. She resented him for several things, and in the end, he never really gave her a chance to either be happy with her husband or of forgetting him, because whether she liked it or not, him being a rich man gave her a power over her, and he used it completely to his advantage. But Kemal's feelings for her are just as complex. I think he was obsessed with her because he saw her as something wanted to acquire and hoard forever rather than putting her own wishes first. At times I wondered why the protagonist shut himself to any other possibilities of finding happiness that did not involve being with Fusun. Because sure, the beginning of their love story is sweet and I get that everyone doesn't react the same to falling in love. But their initial encounters didn't seem to me that worthy of a lifelong obsession. So I would start to ponder if Kemal saw Fusun as an excuse to escape the fate that his family and friends expected of him because of his station in life. And at other times I was wondering if Kemal wasn't a masochist. But it's interesting to analyze his character development as a reader and that of Fusun as well. Because while I do feel for him deeply and I do think that he loved her in his very own intense particular way, in the end he wanted to control everything about her, from her friends to her fate, even if he doesn't actually see that this is exactly what he's doing. The fact that the book is written from his point of view makes an interesting point because the author has to handle situations by writing them from Kemal's subjective take on things but nonetheless giving the reader an opportunity to identify the bigger, more objective picture in the background. So yeah, some final thoughts would be that this is a book full of the irony of fate. At the very start of the book, Kemal says that the happiest moment of his life has to do something with one of Fusu's earrings. And yet, years later, during an important night for both of them, a pivotal point in their relationship, he doesn't even register the fact that she's wearing them again. Also, the fact that Fusun says she wants to become a movie star, she admires Grace Kelly, and her ambition to learn how to drive means that Kemal teaches her how to drive. And in the end, while Fusun doesn't actually follow Kelly's acting footsteps, does share the same manner of her death in a car accident. And now that I've read the novel, I feel that these plot devices may sound a bit obvious, but as I was reading The Museum of Innocence, I didn't even consider the possibility of such ironies. And another thing that I was left considering after I finished the book was that maybe Fusun and Kemal ought to have been lovers during the years that she was married to another man. It might have made me feel like Kemal's feelings for her were more justified, but despite other things, maybe Fusun was glad of being able to wield the card of abstinence 
over Kamal, seeing as she didn't have that much power in other areas of their relationship. And I've always find complicated, twisted love stories fascinating within the realm of literature. They're so appealing to me. But I must say that when it comes to the Museum of Innocence, this was a double-edged sword, definitely. At times, the relationship between Kamal and Fusun reminded me of Lee Tan Humbert from the story of Lolita. With all the allusions to a more powerful man forcing what he wants from his lover by manipulating circumstances and because they're told from the point of view of the man. Or it also put me in mind of Frollo and Esmeralda from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. In Victor Hugo's work, Frollo, my favorite character there, would rather see Esmeralda, the object of his obsessive desires, dead than with another man. And towards the end I was left wondering if some part of Kemal didn't feel at least at peace by the fact that Fusun was dead because then there was no risk of her ever leaving him for another man or for stardom seeing as in the end though they were arguing she died sitting beside him just after they had made love and were ready to try and start a life together anyways I can wrap up this section without mentioning three more things how I love that during and after her divorce, I felt the most connected with Fusun, sensing her distressful and conflicting emotions for Kermal acutely. Again, I get the feeling that she did love him and was touched by his devotion and wanted to make him happy. If maybe only just for the sake that their lives hadn't been a complete waste of time so far. But in the end, she was disappointed in the way her life had turned out, even though she was not even 30. And she struggled with her resentment of Kim because she knew Kemal was to blame for much of her unhappiness. That is why I think she tried to impose certain orders he had to follow if they were to have a future together. It made Fusun feel as if she had agency in her own life again and in the future that Kemal had designed for the both of them. Because while she may have wanted to marry him at the start of the book, too much had happened since then to, for such a future to be her only heart's desire. Finally, I wonder what Kemal's feelings would have been if Fusun had become a mother, either giving birth to her husband's baby or to Kemal's. For the moment though, I believe that this is all I have to say about the Museum of Innocence. Thank you very much for watching my review of it. Please let me know if you enjoyed it or not and what are your own thoughts on this story because I would love to talk about it with you. In the description box below you can find a link to the Goodreads page for the novel and well. I am Caro Herrera, the mental traveler, and I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world. I'll be seeing you soon. Goodbye.